We promised God that we'd never solicit for funds, we'd never raise any money, and we'd never take up a collection, and we never have. There are several churches that have placed the children's home in their budget. There are a number of people individually that help us. There are several civic organizations that help us. But we receive no federal aid. We receive no state welfare aid. And uh, we're not underwritten or sponsored by the denomination. We love the lot. And we have a good time. They're just great to us. The Lord truly blesses. He's really blessed us, too. is dedicated exclusively to services for the cerebral palsy. This is WBUE Channel 8 in New Orleans. Fields. United Cerebral Palsy is dedicated exclusively to services for the cerebral palsy. This is WBUE Channel 8 in New Orleans. Louis Delafere with the news. Channel 8's comprehensive report of news, sports, and weather. Good evening, everyone. President Nixon talked with newspaper editors tonight on national television, and the topic again was Watergate and the president's credibility. ABC's Tom Gerald reports from Orlando, Florida. The traveling Washington press corps was kept behind the ropes in the back of the hall while questioning was limited to about 400 newspaper managing editors. They stood and applauded as the president entered. Although much of the questioning was predictable, there were a few hard ones, virtually all on Watergate. The president, for the first time, described his end of a telephone call in June 1972 with John Mitchell, a call which somehow escaped the White House tape machinery, in which Mitchell contends he would have told the president all about White House involvement in Watergate had the president only asked. Looking back, maybe I should have cross-examined and say, John, did you do it? I probably should have asked him, but the reason I didn't is that I expected him to tell me, and he had every opportunity to do, and decided that he wouldn't, apparently. At least, now that doesn't mean to tell me that he was involved, because you understand that's still a matter that's open. The question is whether he could have told me about other people that might be involved, where he had information, where members of my staff did not have information. The president confirmed he had his brother's telephone tapped, saying it was for national security reasons. He confirmed he paid very little income tax in 1970 and 71. But while admitting mistakes in his political campaign, the president insisted he has not committed any serious misdeeds. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes. But in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. He expressed a personal dislike for the prospect of gasoline rationing. I found that if you get a bunch of government bureaucrats, and in order to have rationing, you'd have to have thousands of them making decisions with regard to who's going to get this much, this much, this much, and rationing. If you're going to try to do that in peacetime, when you do not have what we had in wartime, you know, support for, you know, don't use, don't use a C uh, ration card it, when you're only entitled to an A. Uh, then you're sort of disloyal or something, or unpatriotic. If you do not have that behind it, I can assure you that a rationing system in peacetime, run by a group of well-intentioned, 
But being bureaucrats as they are, gaining and feeling their power would be something that the American people would resent very, very much. To conserve fuel, the president said he's discontinued the use of a backup jet when he travels. I came down here in a plane here today, Air Force One. I asked him if I couldn't take the Jet Star. They said, no, it doesn't have communications. So I had to take the big plane. But we did one thing that saved half the cost. We didn't have the backup plane. Secret Service didn't like it. Communications didn't like it. I don't need a backup plane. This one goes down, it goes down. And then they don't have to impeach. So. The president extended the hour-long session himself. Even then, a lot of questions were not answered. That seemed to reflect the depth of the problem, a problem which he himself was dismissing just a few weeks ago by criticizing others for wallowing in Watergate. Tom Gerald, ABC News at Disney World in Florida. Governor Edwin Edwards says that he has a package of legislation on natural gas, which he thinks the special session of the legislature will okay next month. But the governor will not say what's in that package, except that he is going to ask the legislature to raise the share that the state gets in taxes on natural gas. Beyond that, he wants to talk to industry leaders on Monday before he puts all his cards on the table. Ever since there's been talk about rationing gasoline soon, a lot of people have been taking a long, hard look at the family car. Could they really make it if they were allowed only 10 or 15 gallons of gas a week? Then there are some people who own gas guzzlers who won't have anything else. Lieutenant Governor Jimmy Fitzmaurice says he's not about to give up his Cadillac limousine because he says he needs it in his work. We caught up with Fitzmaurice at the state office building today as he was about to make a trip to Baton Rouge. While some politicians say they will not give up their big cars until President Nixon does, Jimmy Fitzmaurice says that he has a practical reason for keeping a big car. Well, if we're going to talk about 10 or 15 gallons a week, uh, we'd better forget all about doing business of the state. Obviously, it won't make it. Uh, I think that we have many important things that will require us going from one place to another. The easiest thing to do is to sit in your office in the state capitol or sit in the office in the state office building in New Orleans, but that's not the way to run government, and I hope we don't come to that. How much gas does a car like this use? This is what, a Cadillac? Uh, well, this is, a, this is 73, and... Uh, we use, I would suppose, uh, conservatively speaking, uh, several tanks a week of, of gasoline uh, just on our in-state driving. We travel about 6,000 miles. And most of that uh, is by air, however. We try to conserve as much as we can, but uh, if the government is going to limit us to 10 or 15 gallons of gas a week, uh, obviously we're going to have to cut down on trying to get to areas that we've been to many times. No chance that you're going to go to a smaller car, huh? No, uh, personally, I think that's a hazard for a man to drive on the highway the way we do with these big concrete trucks and gravel trucks. We meet them on every side road and back road. Uh, quite frankly, I think it's important to have a heavy car when you're traveling the highways of Louisiana. And uh, I have no intentions as of this time to doing that. More news in just a moment. In Homa and Gonzales, coming soon to Hammond, Reserve, Bay St. Louis, Picayune, Venice, Thibodeau, and Lockport. The 12-year-old son of Senator Edward Kennedy, Edward Jr., had his right leg amputated above the knee today. The doctors say that operation was necessary to try to stop the spread of bone cancer. A spokesman at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington says that young Kennedy's uh, condition tonight is satisfactory. New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison says that some members of Congress will soon try to get Congress to open a new investigation into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's been 10 years since Kennedy was killed in Dallas, and since then, Garrison has been at the forefront in saying that it was not Lee Harvey Oswald alone who killed the president. He says that there are enough unanswered questions for some congressmen to ask for an investigation now. But Garrison says that it will not be easy to get a congressional investigation started. And the reason there will be counterforces against a, a congressional inquiry which would bring out the truth is because the government itself was involved. Elements of the government uh, were involved in the murder of John Kennedy. The government knows it and it cannot afford to have people know it. So there will be a tremendous counter reaction. But the point is at least some movement will begin. Garrison considers the Warren Commission investigation into Kennedy's death a fraud and a cover-up. And since the commission ended its investigation, concluding that Oswald was the lone assassin, some members of the commission, like Vice President-designate Gerald Ford, have become prominent in government. 
every member of the Warren Commission necessarily had to know he was participating in a fraud. Uh, the members of the Warren Commission clearly showed that uh, towards the end of their inquiry, in quotes, because they didn't really inquire into anything. They showed that when they refused to look at the pictures of the autopsy. Uh, the photographs of the autopsy, uh, they refused to look at them. And uh, they couldn't look at them because it would show them things that they didn't want to know, such as the fact that the shot which, uh, the final shot which killed Jack Kennedy, uh, hit him in the temple and came from the front which is, uh, uh, I'm quoting from the death certificate filed by the civilian doctors in the Parkland Hospital in Dallas. So anyway, what it comes down to is Gerald Ford necessarily and knowingly participated in one of the great major frauds in the history of the American Republic. And uh, President Nixon has to know this too. And to select a man who has participated in fooling the American people as a uh, as vice president, uh, to make him vice president is, uh, is an insult to every thinking American. But uh, that's, there's nothing new about that. Uh, that's just a continuation, of, I think, of, uh, of what we're beginning to learn about uh, uh, the essential corruption of, uh, of our federal government. There is a movie on the garrison theory of the Kennedy assassination that has just opened here in New Orleans. It is from Mark Lane's novel on a conspiracy to kill the president. It's called Executive Action and stars Burt Lancaster, the late Robert Ryan, and Will Gear. Newsweek's Maury North has this review. Executive Action is a painful film to watch. You have to be a conspiracy buff to know how accurate its logic really is. In the film, actors portray those who plan the killing, and newsreel footage is used of actual events. The film says that Lee Harvey Oswald could not have fired the gun that killed President Kennedy. According to executive action, Oswald was being used as the fall guy by a group of wealthy right-wing conspirators. In the next few months, you're going to see JFK do the following. One, he's going to lead the black revolution instead of fighting it. Now, we all know what that means, don't we? Damn right, a white backlash. Federal troops backing up the blacks, blood in the streets. Two, he's going to try to put across a test ban treaty with the Russians. And three, he's going to try to pull out of Vietnam and turn Asia over to the communists. Ridiculous. The American public would never stand for that. Come on, Harold. The American public will stand for what it has to stand for, what it's told to stand for, or what it's educated to stand for. Done effectively the public would soon be disenchanted with the war. Which would make action imperative. What kind of action? Executive. The film suffers because it depends on convincing the audience of its arguments verbally. The action often dissolves into stilted lecturing. But if you've ever wondered about Oswald's strange past, or details like, why did all the telephones in Washington go dead right after the assassination, then you'll be even more troubled after seeing executive action. I'm Maureen Orth. More news in just a moment. Every time she says, Keith, I just shake like a leaf, but I'm calm under the arm. Gel can. The Skylab 3 astronauts moved into their Earth-orbiting space station today, hauling in several hundred pounds of food, film, and other supplies from their command module. They're going to be up in Skylab for at least 60 days, and the mission can be extended to a record-breaking 84 days if everything's going well. Well, the circus is in New Orleans again. It is the Jerusalem Temple Shrine Circus, which paraded down Canal Street today before opening a nine-day run in Municipal Auditorium. The circus is 30 acts strong, and the money from the circus goes to Shriners Hospitals for crippled children and for the treatment of burns. One of the stars of this circus is Carl Walenda, the famous high-wire walker. Walenda, now 68 years old, has walked across canyons in the Houston Astrodome and other stadiums around the country. And tomorrow, at 11.30 in the morning, for the public, he's going to walk from the top of Municipal Auditorium, 400 feet, across a parking lot. It is something different, you know. Uh, you can't do not always the same thing, and people uh, get leery about it, want to see some different ideas, and that's what I'm doing now. Well, it certainly has been a big attraction. Do uh, you think that, that people come to, uh, to see if you're going to fall, if you're really going to make it? No, I don't think so. I, uh, I tell you something. 
I was just working in Philadelphia with uh, Ivor Kanida Niva together. So I made the first half and he made the second half. And both of us admired what each one doing. And I said, I want to do your stuff. And he said, I want to go up there, you know. But uh, we discussed this. The people don't come, they want to see you get killed or what. They only admire people, how much courage you have. You carry on doing this kind of work and everything. I think it's more admiration to, you want to see him in person, you know. That's tomorrow morning at 11.30 on the St. Anne Street side in Municipal Auditorium. And one final note, at the circus parade today, a little bulldog went a little crazy over all the excitement. We don't know what it was that set the bulldog off. Maybe it was the sight of elephants on Canal Street. Anyway, the strong arm of the law quickly put a stop to his snapping at everyone within distance of his teeth, and literally collared the dog. The last we heard, he was still being questioned. Vince Marinello has all of the weekend football action, including Tulane football action, right after this. For thousands of years, the one way to burn incense was with fire. Now there's a new way. You're the fire. You're Police first half highlight. The night long, the... Rainy school day, this bus is about to drop off its final load of kids. This is not a school. These kids are coming home, 31 of them in all, and they're part of a family of 46 kids of Reverend and Mrs. Harold Brown. Here at the Fairhaven Children's Home, it's just one big family because the Browns always wanted it that way. Inside, there's the kind of sound you expect when you have 46 children. For the Browns, it's welcome. They could only have one of their own children, so they adopted three and started adding children from broken homes. Today, they have legal custody of 42 children aged 2 to 17 on a big 40-acre farm outside of Covington. And it's here that the kids eat, sleep, and play together. This is what the kitchen's like at mealtime. Technically, it's a children's home, licensed by the state. But for the Browns, who used to be in the ministry, Fairhaven is more than that. And for our policies, here in the home, uh, we try uh, as best we can just to have a home atmosphere. Uh, it's been our desire all the way along to guard against becoming an institution. Mm -hmm. Children don't need to be in an institution. They need to be in a home and they need a home atmosphere. And so we don't have a lot of rules and regulations. We have a, a bedtime and a getting up time. We have a meal time and we have a devotional time. Uh, we really try to raise our children as normal, you know, as, uh, as we can, even though we're a large family, I'm still the mama and my husband's their daddy. And, so, Each um, one gets that individual attention? Well, we, uh, we try to give it to them as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's uh, just like any other house. Tomorrow, more on the Brown family. How they get by with a little help from their friends. Louis de Laforet, News Scene 8. kids with a little help from their friends. People who know about the Brown home contribute regularly. Then companies donate time and services and merchandise. High school and community service clubs volunteer time and gifts. 
The family buys their food wholesale, and sometimes there are food deals with a nearby convent. They get milk from their own cows, meat from their own cattle and pigs, and never once have the Browns solicited money, taken a collection, or asked for state or federal help. A lot of people used to ask me, say, well, uh, Harold, why don't you uh, uh, take uh, federal monies and welfare aid and said you could take care of so many children. And I said, yes, but, uh, you know, this was back in the days of Governor McKithen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, we teach our children that God is able to supply all of our needs. And if we took the state money and the federal money, then when we bowed our head, we'd have to thank the state exalt the state for taking care of us. And this way that we can raise them to know that there is a God in heaven that knows, there is a God that loves. And the God that said that he would be a father to the fatherless and that he'd supply their needs. And so uh, by not taking federal aid and uh, state aid, we're able to just uh, uh, go to the Lord with our needs and to know that he'll supply. Mrs. Brown was an only child and she says she always wanted a large family. Well, she's got it and also 10 to 12 loads a day in a washing machine that holds 25 pounds, an endless line of cuts and scratches, and a love, comfort, and good night list that you would not think anyone could remember. You can name all, all of the uh, children. That's over 40 of them. Yes, uh -huh. and uh, I can name them all. They're all, they're individuals, and, uh, and we, you know, know them as individuals. Uh, because I'm their mama. Mama and Papa Brown have two sets of twins. The rest of the children, well, the baby is two and the oldest is 17. And they'd like to get more children. Right now, because of regulations, they're turning away 50 to 75 children a year. But there are plans to make room for more. Because the Browns already have room in their hearts. Louis de Laforet, News Scene 8.